Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Frank Radis, and this is the third time uh, that I've been fortunate enough to bring a really brilliant group of people together to make up what we've come to know as the immersive media think tank. So make of that title what you will. What I try to get um, from our group is uh, music and uh, fun and entertainment. No, uh, I, I, want, I want you to walk away from, uh, from what we do and what we say up here with some useful uh, information. So uh, let's start with all the way on that end of the table, uh, the guy looking for the water, uh, Roy, tell us who you are Mark and uh, what you do right now, and we'll go down the line Mark and let everybody introduce themselves. Sure, my name is Roy Taylor. Uh, until recently, I was head of uh, AMD Studios, and uh, I left, left there in March to, uh, to set up my own business. Hi, my name is Joanna Popper. I joined HP to head up location-based entertainment for virtual reality in January. Hi, I'm Laura Feynman, and I lead the sales efforts at Jaunt for the last almost year and a half. Hi, I'm Camille Salucci, and I'm head of production at The Void, and I joined The Void in February. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joel Dweck. I'm the co-founder of Echo VR. We do uh, sound and music for virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. So about a year and a half ago, uh, I was in London and attending the uh, VR summit where I saw Roy speak. Uh, at the time, uh, Roy was with AMD, so I'm, uh, for, for those of you who aren't here because it's Nerdstock, AMD is probably the place where you get your chips from. So he had a lot to do with what was going on in VR, certainly at the time. It was the most impressive presentation I saw during that, uh, during that event. Um, Tell me a little bit, Roy, about where VR started and what the sort of the three phases of VR are and where we are today. So uh, depending on what you read, and we were Googling just before we came out here, uh, <laughs> VR actually started in 1680. Uh, but I would say that we are on the third go around. You know, the first major uh, iteration of VR was in the uh, uh, 70s. And then the last time around, uh, we saw uh, Sega and Nintendo launch their VR. Uh, incidentally, it's an interesting fact that although they were considered not to be successful, uh, Nintendo actually sold over 750,000 units of their VR back uh, back in the 80s. So this is the kind of the third go around, and I believe that VR is going to be really successful on its fourth go around. <laughs> so, w would you say that VR is dead? I would say that. Um, we have to be realistic, and uh, some of you will know that I probably was the, the uh, wave to flag the loudest and the highest for VR and was wildly enthusiastic about, enthusiastic about it for quite some time. I'm still in, enthusiastic about the medium. In terms of the of, uh, immersion, I don't think there's anything that comes anywhere close to immersing us in a story that, as VR does. But as sad as it, it's, it saddens me to say, you know, we have to face the truth, which is that VR for consumers uh, is, a, is not working. It's a flop. Um, sales of uh, headsets uh, for HTC, I don't know what the numbers are, um, but this Christmas we will not all be buying five, six hundred dollar headsets. Uh, we might buy some of the cheaper ones, uh, but then I think the challenge is the immersion is not as good as with the better ones, and the content's not there. So I would say in terms of consumer home sales, yes, it's, it's not working. Uh, for location-based VR, and I think we're very lucky to have, a, have a, uh, two guests here today because I think location VR is evidently a success. And enterprise VR is doing very, very well as well. So uh, for security, safety training, uh, design, uh, VR is okay. So VR is in good shape, just not for consumers, in my opinion. Well, I think that takes us pretty naturally to Joanna um, to talk a little bit about um, what seems to be the thing in VR today, in immersive media and immersive content today, and that is place-based applications uh, for VR, which is what you're doing. Yes. So HP is focusing on four, four industry verticals, actually, which segues well from what you said. So the four, the four industry verticals are architecture, engineering, construction, location-based entertainment, 
military and first responder training and simulation and healthcare. And so I, I'm, I have an entertainment background. I was at NBCU for many years, along with Frank, um, which is how we know each other. And so I'm focused on building out our location-based entertainment business. So that that's really you know I think there's you, you, your opinion of pretty uh, bleak prognosis at the same at the same time. You know, to say to say broadly it's not working is I think is, is pretty bleak. But they're they're just the, the industries had to pivot into areas where they're seeing more growth for now. And so absolutely it's enterprise. And then I while location based entertainment is a sort of an enterprise B two B play. It's the place that I think most consumers will get the first great experience of VR, where you know for the price of a ticket for that a great fun experience that you have with your family, you can you know with, without having to spend the money to get the products at home and without having to you know, learn how to set them up or to figure out what content you need to see. That's so I, I'm incredibly excited about this. I know we're going to hear from Camille. We're, 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 we're going to get, we're gonna hey, get Frank, into Can we just do a test? Go ahead. Can you put your hand up if you've uh, used VR in your own home in the last two weeks? Hmm. OK. Much better than I'd have thought. Yeah, yeah me too. And I, and, you know, I, I think the these the standalones headsets will also have some impact on the continued growth of the consumer market. But you know, in terms of where my company's strategy is going, it is right now focused on you know, the enterprise sectors plus LBE because in the in the shortest run, we see that being that being the where, where the most monetization will come. Could you raise your hands if you're a developer? Go ahead. Uh, ask the second half of that question. Has anybody received more than $500,000 of funding in total for your VR? That's one guy. <laughs> What's your name? Two. Two. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Two. Just but kidding. how many raised their hands? Like four in the first place. So that's 50%. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Nice. Congratulations. So 50% yeah. of all uh, VR developers. So you know, that, that <laughs> takes me away. into, uh, you know, what is... Uh, what is successful uh, VR, uh, immersive consumer, um, immersive media? What does the a successful business development look like in, 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 from your perspective uh, at John? Um, I think it's creating immersive content for brands that allows them to connect with their consumers in a, in a whole new, fresh way. Um, and I think we're also really leaning in on the experiential piece and, um, you know, extending that content that we're creating to events and activations. And that's become a really big um, piece for brands in how they're reaching their consumers. So that's, that's clearly become a really big piece for what Jaunt has become. Yeah. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, in the early days, Jaunt was a place to go to get content if you were an individual and you wanted to see that stuff at home. Right. Uh, and it had a, it's, it's got a good user uh, interface and it's, it's a good place to get content. Um, but you're now moving, you're not moving away from that, but you're putting more emphasis on play space than on experiential? Um, yeah, I would say that we've sort of flipped that and our goal is to distribute immersive content to consumers wherever they are and however they can experience it. So whether it be distributing the content in 360 across a variety of publishers and social outlets like Facebook and YouTube, or whether it be distributing the content to an activation like something we did with Kia where we brought consumers to the Detroit Auto Show and they could experience um, in a uh, virtual test drive. And we did that at the Detroit Auto Show. Um, so I think you know our, our goal is to really get the content to as many places as possible to make it as accessible as possible for consumers to, to have that experience. So in order for consumers to actually have that experience, consumers need to know that that experience is out there. Mm -hmm. Reach and frequency of message and all of that marketing lingo. Um, so I would imagine then that some installation of a social component uh, would be important to the proliferation of VR as, as we think it is today. Yes? Is that something that you guys do? Yeah, so social component, it, it, like are you talking like... So that you can make sure that your VR, well, 
rather than stick this on you, yeah. I'll pass along and go to Camille, who yeah. I know <laughs> um, has, uh, who has, <laughs> who has figured that part out, and that's important. First of all, has anyone here been to the any of the the void? Have you been to the void? It's good. Like did you it. did, did you like it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> good. So um, the, uh, that's uh, that's Camille's baby. Uh, and probably one of the coolest things I've ever experienced as, a, as somebody who is a real uh, geek when it comes to being in the VR world. Um, because it does some things that you don't expect it to do. So get, tell me a little bit about, because yes, I'm glad you all went, but if you haven't been, you don't know what the void is. Tell me about the void. Well, the void is a location-based, um, we're calling it a hyper-reality experience. Um, where it's multi-sensory so ideally you go in and you know where you touch walls the walls are there there and we we work to have your brain believe that it's actually in that location by hitting all of the senses instead of just visual and audio which are two of the very important components but there's wind and there's heat and there's um, rumbling floors and there's haptics in your vest and so when you go through it you have an, a, a, what I believe is sort of a fully, truly immersive experience. And one of the cool things and one of the, the important things for The Void is that people get a chance to do it together. And I've seen people come out of The Void who didn't know each other at all and walked out like hugging each other um, from just going through this experience together and, uh, you know, winning, winning the battles. Um, so that's that's basically it and we're working to open you know locations across the world we currently have eight and um, where are they they are in um, London I'll start from that side I guess well I should start maybe from Dubai and then London and um, Toronto and New York and Orlando and Vegas and Glendale and Disney Springs did I get all eight Christian? Yeah. okay good mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so 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 that's where we are, and uh, some places have what we call stages. We kind of refer to it in our internal language as stages. So some places have two stages, and some places have one. Um, and we're ve we have an incredible team working really hard to get as many locations open as possible before um, Roy's prediction comes true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now uh, Joel um, uh, is primarily uh, interested in sound sonic development, sonic design, and uh, uh, in, in the space of VR, the idea of uh, 360 audio and uh, spatial sound, which is, to, in my way of thinking, having started out as a film editor, I, I always felt that sound was way more important than just what you saw, sorry to some of my visual effects people out there. Um, but it's, um, uh, it, it seems to me that it's the saving grace if you're a director um, uh, to be able to make people attend to some individual thing in their light of, line of sight by making them go there because of the sound. How, so it's not just in, 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 a, in a, like an entertainment situation, it's also in a uh, play-based situation. Talk to me a little bit about the importance of sound in those two spaces. If you, you know, are watching a 2D film, you know, projected on a screen in front of you, um, that's really the only place you're going to be looking. Um, but when you've got a 360 space uh, where things can be happening behind you or anywhere, um, you need uh, tools to be able to direct people's attention if you want them to turn around or not. This is one of the, I think, things that probably directors bemoan most what going into VR is that you lose control. You lose control of your, your user, your audience, and that's a good thing. Uh, but you can still influence um, them on a number of levels. And so attention directing is, is something that uh, sound is fundamentally very, very good for uh, in VR. So I can create a sound over here, and subliminally you'll just want to turn around and you'll notice the action that's behind you. So that's, that's pretty important. But I think you know, it also serves the same role that it would do in, in, in film in general, which is that um, while you know, for the majority of VR experiences, the void not included, um, you know, sound is 50% of the available experience, 50%. And yet it's really not harnessed uh, to its full capacity. When we're talking about the emotional uh, aspect of, you know, of a VR experience, 
uh, the music can account for a much higher percentage of that. You know, um, there's been many kind of experiments done where you can either have no music or replace music, and, and you can see quite how differently people perceive things. Um, and I'll add to that, you know, in fact, haptics, which is proprioception, which is in some sense is the origin of, of hearing anyway. So that, that tactile, that presence of, uh, of vibration is part of that emotional experience. It's absolutely huge. So it's a really fundamentally important um, you know, role that it plays. I would say much more important than it does in, in film and television. So there are areas um, that occupy our entertainment cortex. So that might be um, television, drama, comedy, reality, sports, news. Uh, it may be feature films. Uh, it may be experiential. Uh, it may be a marketing tool that just feels like it's something pretty cool to go and watch. So you look at it and you think it's content. Um, but the things that, that sort of strike me uh, as a, uh, a creator of that kind of content, Roy, uh, is that you really can't do dramas and comedies in VR. No, I don't agree. Why are you saying that? Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I've just finished, I've just no, finished no, no, a couple please. of those. One at a time, Roy. So one of the uh, first pieces of VR that I um, ever experienced was uh, as a wedding scene. And, uh, and in the middle of the couple getting married, and they ask, does uh, anybody object to this wedding as part of the ceremony? And then over, it's interesting we said about sound, over your left shoulder, actually someone stands up and says, yes, they shouldn't get married. So you immediately look around. So the audio cue may, helped you to experience the VR. And uh, it was a compelling drama. So this guy says, no, they shouldn't get married because of this. And then you hear this other couple talking over here saying, well, you know, she had an affair with that guy, blah, blah, blah. So, and the drama was great. I wanted to know why they couldn't get married. <laughs> I was captured instantly. Yeah. So I think that uh, you, you can, but a lot of thought needs to be given to the direction. How, how, how do, when I first heard you talking, you mentioned, uh, uh, I think it was a USC uh, course in uh, how to write was it USC or UCLA, and how to write for VR and drama and comedy? Yeah, write, yeah. writing, uh, I actually think that uh, in, in virtuality that writing has been, uh, been, hasn't received recognition and, uh, and is a real, real skill because the, the, uh, you know, the, the viewer can, can wander off uh, and he can be distracted. So writing is, uh, is really, really very, very important. And, uh, and deserves, uh, I think, more, more investment, both in terms of paying people to do it and then people also exploring the media. Um, you know, I, one of the things that, uh, that frustrates me is that we haven't seen more really, really great VR because it is so immersive and we can do so much more. Um, you know, the whisk of wattling on. Um, <laughs> I, on your point on audio, I think is great. You know, the human audio uh, system is fabulous. Um, if somebody was to drop something outside in the room over the back here, uh, you would know whether they, what they dropped was kind of wooden or metallic or made of cloth. And the, our audio system is brilliantly designed because our lives uh, until recently def uh, depended on it. And sometimes they still might. So we can tell occluded sound and ambient sound really, really well. And that's never in films or television because usually we're watching in an in a auditorium which doesn't have the right kind of speakers or at home where we have to rely on television speakers. There's so much more we can do with VR and, uh, and I feel that we deserve better VR. I wanted to add also, I mean, th th this question of kind of categorizing things as, as uh, you know, comedy and drama, I, I think also that we can kind of pull that apart a little bit and deconstruct it in VR. I think that some of the pieces that I've seen um, that in, in many ways were the most surprising, and most impressive, uh, were somewhere between what, what you might say is documentary and narrative. Um, there's one piece in particular, it's a jaunt piece called The Collisions, uh, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And it really is, it, for me, that's the one that blew it all open. Uh, because it is, it's, it is a documentary, but it comes across, it reads as a narrative. And it does this because... Yeah, as a dramatic narrative. As a dramatic narrative. Yes. And, and yet you're, um, you, you experience it differently because you're, you're there, you're in it. And it started making me think that, you know, something very unique about, uh, you know, this ability of VR is, uh, you know, our lives are neither documentary nor narrative. They're somewhere in between. Um, you know, it's a string of facts, you know, that we come here at one o'clock and we speak. 
but we also come with our emotions and our stories and everything like that. And, and I think VR is able to tell that much better because we're in it, we're, in, we're invested in it, we feel it personally, it's an experience. Um, so I think there's something very interesting there in terms of tweezing apart the actual categories of films. So Joanna, um, in, in your new role with HP, um, uh, when you're out there doing some type of, uh, of a location-based VR experience, um, are you doing it as a marketer, uh, as a content distributor, uh, um, as an entertainment executive? What, what, how do you approach the kind of work that you do? It's an interesting question. Yeah. Like how do I how do how do I approach my job, or how yeah. do I? Yeah, I, I mean, how do I, do? I, mean, I went. To, yeah, sometimes it's a drama. Sometimes it's a narrative. Sometimes it's a comedy. <laughs> So Sometimes I, it's reality. I, I mean, is, is it, Sometimes is it's it, late night. I'm glad you asked this. Well, Sometimes I think it's what I'm, what I'm getting at is where can you where can somebody make money in in uh, in VR? Can 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 you is is there a way to be a marketer and be in VR? Is there? I way, think Mar VR there? needs more marketers. I okay, think that's one so that, of, that's one of that's, the, that's that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I mean, so so I mean, kind of going back to some of the stuff that we talked about earlier. I I think that. The, the, what, the way I look at it, and I think the way that a lot of our companies are looking at it, is that this industry is still in its nascent stages. So none of the numbers that we're seeing are where we, we expect them to go. The content isn't where we expect it to go. The technology is not where we expect it to go. The numbers of location-based entertainment uh, places that are out there right now are incre rap growing incredibly rapidly. but. You know, they're, 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 you know, they'll, they'll, all of those things will probably see some level of hockey stick, right? So for me, I think there's five, base, five major things that need to happen to get us to this place that is mass adoption. And, and one of them is, is marketing, which is why I was bringing this around. So it's that continued technological improvement where we have tons of companies with amazing engineering talent and billions of dollars getting poured in. We have amazing content creators coming from diverse areas such as immersive theater to to TV to film to, to you know to sound to sound and um, VFX coming together and bringing all their skill sets in we have location-based entertainment places that are rapidly rapidly scaling so you know there was I don't know six months ago there are probably three places you could go in LA or fewer now there is probably 14 that you can go and just just in this one city um, and that's you know just a few months uh, th that the so th that making sure that there is that social interaction and you don't feel the isolation there's a couple of different places where you can do that right now one is in location-based entertainment and in, in some of the places the Another one is social collaboration tools like Altspace and Spaces and um, VR chat. VR, VR chat. chat is yeah, and and you know many the, there's a whole bunch of those. And then the 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 fifth, and it brings to the question that you asked is the consumer education and the consumer marketing. And I think as an industry, we've done. What we've done is, up to now, is, ha is marketed like a technology and not marketed like an entertainment or an experience. And that has been a problem. Um, we've confused ourselves and consumers with the alphabet soup of VR and AR and MR and XR, and like we all use the terms differently. And, um, and no, nobody wants to go to, nobody even, you know, if you, th that's not a compelling experience. If you think about how TV or film are marketed, they're not marketed about you know, letting you know that you can drive your car to sit in a dark room in a place with a bunch of people you don't know in a chair that's less comfortable than your couch, right? It's all about the talent, it's about the experience, it's about the acceleration. So we're not, you know, e even the new Oculus Go ads, they're still just showing you, you know, on the subway platform, a headset. They're not showing you that you can go to that, you know, climb Mount Everest, they're not showing you can swim with sharks, they're not showing you, you know, all the So cool, that's cool the things. technology. That's not the... They're marketing the tech for early adopters. Nobody has yet. I think the best one is Samsung, where they did the ostrich ad. But yeah. that, that's, that's a yeah. big problem. Yeah. That we're, a we're not talking to, to, you know, we're not talking to, like, regular people about that cool experience they could have. We're talking to the way that the, the marketing and education has done, been done is just well, really just for early adopters. How many Interesting people here have seen the ostrich ad? Mm -hmm. The what? Huh? The, the ostrich, ostrich ad advert by Samsung. Samsung. 
So you should be 100%. Right? Yeah. Well, I'm then surprised. that's a problem with Samsung's media buying. That's not a problem with the ad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but one, of the things that I'll, one of the things that I want to throw in there for the void is that, you know, we're actively not marketing the technology um, and actively working to market to experience. the experience. And, um, and obviously it was very strategic to open with, um, for those of you who don't know, right now what's running is Secrets of the Empire, where um, it's a Star Wars experience where you can go in and, and fight for the rebellion. Um, and, uh, you know, that was to be able to piggyback on one of the most beloved pieces of content of, of all time that has a huge fan base, obviously, and has, has multiple across the ages so that we have, you know, kids 10 years old and my 83-year-old mom going through, um, going through the void and, and the big thing for us is that it's all about them making their own stories. And um, one of the things we've been talking about a lot is sort of story living and them getting a chance to live out their, that the, 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 we, we refer to our audience now as guests because they're guests in the void and, and we want, they're, they're in essence our ultimate boss and we're very responsive to them. And so we want to make sure that we're marketing in a way, and it's a huge challenge because, as you say, we have created an alphabet soup that's completely confusing to us, let alone the consumers. So we're working to get away from talking about that and talking about making memories together and um, going out and being in a place you could never be before and seeing something that you haven't seen before and, and, and you know, the whole in the beginning everybody kept calling it the empathy machine but getting a chance to feel things that you might not have felt before because you're you're walking in a place and feeling in a place and smelling things that you just haven't had that opportunity to do so as we continue to build this hopefully we'll get a chance to to do more and more of that well and and you were also uh, to go back a little bit about the addition of the additional layer of social uh, if you are an, a guest who is creating their own experience then you can share that social experience with other people now adding another layer to what VR is. Absolutely, absolutely, and you get to do it with you know you get to do it with friends, or you get to do it with strangers that you become friends on the way out. <laughs> well, I personally saved the uh, galaxy uh, myself in the void, and uh, I, I did <laughs> absolutely. get absolutely thank I, you, friend. I, you're welcome. I did get shot a few times, and the haptics are really kind of interesting because you do feel a shock. It was pretty amazing. Um, so uh, how how um, how does jaunt? Uh, look at the landscape right now and say this is where we think we need to be yeah I mean I was actually gonna add into what Joanna was saying and I think this is kind of uh, the right place based on your question as well but you know I think we have been as an industry so focused on the technology for so long that we've sort of lost sight that creative should have a voice in this medium as well and what we have done really well at Jaunt is because we have a full technology solution um, that enables the distribution of immersive assets on one side of our business and on the other side of our business we're award-winning content creators you know we allow our creative team and our, our um, our creativity to help drive and inform our technology. So, you know, a great example of this is a piece that we recent, recently created for Diageo, which is a public service announcement. And it basically follows four main characters at a dinner party, at a going away party that quickly escalates into a um, house party. And what's unique about it is you have the ability as the consumer um, to interact with the content and change perspective between these four main characters in real time. So how I consume alcohol versus how she consumes alcohol versus how you consume alcohol <laughs> and the amounts we're consuming throughout this party is very different. Um, and the technology allows you to change between in real time between each of our perspectives so you can now be Camille, or you can be Joanna, or you can be me instantly and see how each of us are watching you know, this party unfold in front of our eyes. And obviously, it ends very differently for each of us depending on how much alcohol we're consuming. So what's, I think what's really unique about it is you know, our creative team came up with this idea, and then we built the te technology to support it and distribute it. And streaming for you know, different streams in real time is quite challenging. So we <laughs> built the technology to do that. Um, and I think that's what we've done really well is kind of using both sides of our business to inform one another and help drive the industry forward. 
Really yeah, and you worked on that. I did. Yeah, we did the uh, yeah. we did the sound and music for that. And it, and I think another as aspect of it that's interesting is not just the the playback part of it that was quite groundbreaking, but what we had to come up with uh, to actually capture it in terms of sound and visuals uh, was entirely new. Um, you know, it's, it, we'd never done anything like that before uh, because we needed effectively four exactly synchronized stories, yeah. acted synchronized, yeah, no one's ever down, to, you know, down to the fraction of the second. And so we came up with some interesting strategies of how to achieve yes. that. Um, and it was, yeah, I would say it's the most difficult project we've ever done and one of the most interesting I think it, it's really it's projects like that that are really pushing that envelope um, pushing the boundaries of, uh, of of how to tell stories in VR yes. um, I think you know we hear a lot about you know there's a lack of content and I, I think partly it's because it's not kind of easy to figure out how to tell a story you know, well, is it also is it also not um, uh, is it also difficult not not only uh, to tell the story, but to actually find it once it's done? Uh, just in terms of yeah. being out there in the world? Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I um, think yeah. a key piece to that is the distribution strategy. So, you know, for every con piece of content that we create, we need a distribution strategy to support it. And that's So there is no the real, piece. other than what you guys have done, which I think is the sort of the premier distribution strategy for VR. Yeah, There's no distribution no. methodology out there? That's, that not, that's not correct. No. No. They, they yeah. do a great yeah. job, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there are other players. Yeah, well, no, tell, tell, tell us about, uh, oh. about why it is that, that you know, <laughs> people are, are complaining that they can't find the stuff that's interesting. I don't know that, that they're all so easy to use, but you know, there's, there's you know, what uh, Steam has done, there's Viveport, there's, right. there's uh, Within. I mean, just yeah, there are some that are more difficult to use. And then, so. there, and then yeah, but, but uh, there is a big play into you know, doing a launch, um, doing a launch in a location-based uh, location entertainment uh, arcade or experience center. You know, there's, there's like a, lo a lot of them, for example, might go to the IMAX where they have se they have seven locations throughout throughout the mm -hmm. world, including one here, mm -hmm. and then either simultaneously or with a windows sh windowing show, or, or they might go to a f they might. I think what I've seen is like a lot of people go to a f they'll go to first to a festival if it's if it's more cinematic. If it's more on the gaming side, they might go to a conference that is more leaning, you know, like, like GDC or something that's more leaning towards games. And then after that, they might go to an arcade or get or get on Springboard. Springboard has I think I don't know something like 150, almost 200 arcades that you can get in if you put your if you put your content onto that platform and there's a couple of other uh, content management systems like Springboard so there's about three or four that you can use like that and they're and they don't require exclusive rights and then after that you can and then you can also distribute on on you know platforms like like yeah. jaunt like within so there's there's plenty of places that you can distribute they're not all easy to understand easy to use um, searchability are, are they are they are also but, not all on the same uh, technical platform. No. So consequently, you might go to one distribution node, and it will be an entirely different experience than where you would what you would get in another distribution Correct. node. So, is that is th does that then say that there should be more uniformity out there? Yes, absolutely. There's a lack of standardization. Every platform has a different file fa format for distributing. So if you're a creator, it's quite challenging to distribute your content across every single platform. Yeah, to the point where some people have to remake their, their yeah, content yeah, to be able to distribute on that particular platform or certainly make significant changes to their content, um, which just drives up the content cost. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll habitually have to deliver in like four or five different versions. Yeah, there's so no YouTube, standardization. YouTube, Facebook 360. I think the question on that is, is are we too, I mean, obviously we that's, too that's early yeah, to figure is that it, out. Is know? it, ti that's time consuming, well, that's expensive, right. but are, are we not yet having a goal. What do you think of that? Are we too early? <laughs> no, I think we're underfunded. Um, it's uh, interesting uh, there's a, uh, to consider that uh, whether you're making a AAA video game or you're making a, uh, a blockbuster movie, that the rough cost of making uh, that kind of content is about a million dollars a minute. And if you look at the average budget of a piece of VR, um, it's lucky if it beats uh, $50,000 a minute. And so unless you give uh, producers uh, and the talent um, so you can actually produce uh, content at that level, then we're always going to be in this kind of stuck position. 
Uh, I believe that there are uh, lots of people in this industry, probably plenty of people in this room, that if you gave them that kind of budget could produce something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, but yet they, that no one's given them the budgets. And uh, one of the mysteries to me, it was a mystery to me three years ago, and it's still a mystery to me today, is why uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook doesn't go out and spend that kind of money to produce that kind of level of content. Because if he did, I think the VR would be in a vastly, vastly different position today. And we would all be buying five, six hundred dollar headsets for Christmas because the experiences would be there to justify them and we'd, we would want them. Yeah, I was going to, uh, yeah, you know, in a sense, what we need to see from Zuckerberg and everybody is a shift from seeing it as a technology to seeing it as a medium, a platform, and to stop kind of beating it up because it doesn't, you know, uh, deliver, um, you know, what we would expect. It's kind of like going out and buying a TV and saying, I'm, I'm going to return the TV because I didn't like what it was showing. <laughs> you know, that's really what's going on. So we need to shift our thinking of, of realize that it's a medium. That's all it is. It's a medium. And it's extremely broad in terms of the effects it can have across all of these different industries. But we need content. We need content and we definitely need the finances to be able to create that. So there's been um, some conversation out there uh, by people who distribute live content. So one of our guests that was going to be with us today but isn't uh, was the guy who's in charge of production for Live Nation. So they're doing um, uh, live musical events and putting you in the audience. Uh, there, there's a, a company, uh, Laduma, that does football in the UK. Um, there's obviously companies in America that do baseball and that do uh, United States football and, and so on and so on and so on. That there is a big place in live event coverage in VR um, as a bucket. Then there is a bucket that is uh, place-based as a bucket. Uh, and then there is another bucket, well, I'm, I'm just hypothesizing here, that's, that is entertainment. And of those three buckets, uh, and entertainment could be dramas, could be comedies. And are you uh, including gaming in that bucket? Because I think gaming is a separate bucket. Actually. Yeah, that's what I think too. Um, so, so now we're looking at what may be four or five buckets for VR. Of those, of those buckets, I want to go down the group here. What, what, what's going to be the what's going to be the one that holds people's interest the most and w w has a future? I think entertainment. Once it's done right, it'll be entertainment. I mean, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to really be able to fly around a city like Spider-Man? Um, but I want to be able to smash through a window, walk into an office. Uh, then I want to be able to swoop down to the ground and swoop back up to the top of the sky again. And I want to do it all in 4K and I want it to be brilliant. I want it to sound fabulous. If I could do that, man, I'd go out and buy a 10 grand headset. So that's what you're working on? You are? No, Thanks. that's what you're working on, I guess. Is that, is that, is that what you're doing now, you're Joanna? Working on you're, that? <laughs> no, I've been very secretive about what I'm working on. Exactly. I, I was wondering if that's it, what it was. Everybody's going to fall down dead with shock. It's going to be great. And it's going to be huge. <laughs> I think it's huge. Spi it's yeah. huge. Spider Man. It's not going to be Spider Man. <laughs> huge. Uh, so, I, don't, I don't think it's like that we have to pick one of those to be the winner. I think that. Via oh, come on. Let me finish. <laughs> Spidey, let me finish. Um, so, it's, so it's not, VR is not just for entertainment or VR, you know, immersive computing. It, this is the future of computing. So when you say, well, what will that be used for? That's like saying, you know, 10, 15 years ago or what, you know, whatever. Well, what's the internet going to be? Or, or longer ago, you probably would have said that. What's the internet going to be used for? They, it's going to be used for everything. So this may be the third wave or fourth wave of VR, but it's... We're, we're in the going before. into the fourth wave. We're, okay, but we're heading into the, the fourth, the, also the fourth wave of computing. So what, today we all have our mobile phones that we're attached to, um, and, but in the future there, there will be a moment that we use uh, our immersive gear for everything that we're using this for, plus a lot more that we haven't discovered yet. So that being said, it's not going to be only comedy or only, uh, you know, only gaming it's going to be that plus you know doctor's visits plus how, however we you know get our lift plus, plus all these things that we learned we're doing with this we're going to do that yeah we said, well obviously you can you can start going to the sort of the sub genres and start talking about a teach teaching uh training you know, i mean yeah. some of the education. things that you know there's been studies Health. on like what do people want to actually do yeah. in immersive computing so it's live events it's uh actually number one is home it was was home uh 
like home improvement, learning, like home design, that's, what, that's the word they use. Home design was number one, education's up there, live sports, uh, you know, so the health, there's so, there's so many different, different um, categories that we will be using this for. So I don't think we have to pick one, one winner for it. Is that okay, Spidey? <laughs> I can deny you nothing. Okay. Power, power, power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Um, I mean, I agree with you as well. I think, um, and I also agree with you. So, uh, <laughs> I don't like it's too much agreement. I want right, to see right. some more competition here. Let's go. Um, I think entertainment and gaming are going to be, you know, are, 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 there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity there. And I think um, we're just at the precipice. Like, I think we're all waiting for that sort of house of cards moment. That mm -hmm. Um, water cooler moment where everyone's like, oh my God, you know, whether it be an AR experience, a VR experience, whatever it is, where it's, you know, just, it, it, it all of a sudden takes off. And I think as the technology gets better, when 5G arrives and, you know, there's so much on the horizon that's going to just explode this industry mm -hmm. that I think, you know, there's, there's... And, and it might not just be 5G, it may also be a, a TSC 3.0, maybe uh, may fall into that too. Uh, as another way to distribute at a, a, a high quality imagery. Um, it's, it's higher resolution, higher yeah. bandwidth, better processing power. I mean, all of that. Which I think has been one of the problems that. with VR through your phone. Yes, mm -hmm, agreed. Absolutely. I mean, and you think about the, the GPS, the, the accelerometer, you know, the camera, all of these features are going to get better and better, which is going to make you know, all of the everyday experiences where AR is, is just an everyday part of your life and, and enhances it that much more, it's going to change dramatically. You know? Just to be clear on the House of Cards moment, we're referring to when everyone realized they had to get Netflix, not yes. when Kevin right. Spacey got fired, right? So just <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually did say that exactly. it, 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 doesn't reach, it doesn't reach its full potential until a Star Wars movie is released in VR only first, which... Yeah. I, I mean, and I think you, you guys at the Void may be as close to yes. that uh, as, as anybody. Well, what's, what's really fun, and I can't say any of the, the big Hollywood IP that we're talking about, but, you know, it's been really fun is... Oh, come on. In the They're beginning... Nice. In the, <laughs> nice try, friend. Um, <laughs> in the beginning, uh, when, we were try, when we were talking about Secrets of the Empire to some of the other filmmakers and things, people were really suspect and they didn't, there wasn't a huge, I mean they were interested and they, they were interested in what this thing was about but they weren't ready to put their IP so we're really thrilled obviously mm -hmm. that ILMX Lab and Lucasfilm and you know such a great partnership with those guys to put this thing into the world and now what's starting to happen is because of that we sort of have this embarrassment of riches where we have a lot of fantastic amazing IP coming to talk to us and, and with one of the IPs that we're developing right now they've actually decided that they want to make it canon they want to make it part of their universe and um, and not just have it be you know sort of a side ride that doesn't doesn't or a, you know a game or whatever they want to call it an experience that doesn't relate to the whole of of their universe which is super exciting for us mm -hmm. also very hard because there's certain parts of you know that we have to figure out how we work and when we release and how all that stuff happens if it's connected to the overarching um, uh, network of, of storytelling that they're doing, but it's it's pretty exciting. I think I think with the success of Star Wars, you know, one of the big things that the Void um, is working towards, and people ask, can you make money at this? And and I absolutely say, with what we're doing with the Void, yes, is you know we're working hard to expand locations, and there, you know, in some of our locations, we've had over a thousand people a day go through. So um, you know, we're really mastering how you how you have people go through the experience because in location based, if you're going to make money and be a sustainable business, it's ultimately all about throughput. Um, but to get back real quick to, to the original question, um, was one of the things that I think is is happening is is rather than categorizing, I think one of the things that's kind of cool about VR is we're going to see more interconnection between everything, between you know the location based that then you can go home and do something and it's going to relate to something and maybe there's a health thing in the in the show that then relates to the health and I think there's we're having lots of conversation about the interconnectedness of all of the various platforms and how each one can enhance each other and ultimately hopefully um, enhance the experience of the guest yeah I strongly agree with with that and with Joanna's um, comment as well because what, what we're looking at is effectively the future of the human computer interface the human machine interface and so it's it's going to be for all of these things um, 
I, I, I'll give a shout out for, for music because obviously that's what I'm in <laughs> and, um, and because Jeff Nicholas couldn't be here. I, you know, I think there's, there's going to be something pretty impressive that can happen with VR and concerts, uh, both from you know, the, you know, the ability to kind of get up close to the artists and on stage, but also on the monetization side of it, that I think it actually can kind of bail out the music industry to some extent. If you imagine that you, know, you can fit in this room, let's say 500 people for a concert, uh, who are paying top dollar, but then around the world you can have a, a pretty decent kind of experience with spatial audio and everything that maybe another billion people can tune into. Even if they're paying you know, just a, a token amount of money, you're generating a large income for this industry, for the band. Um, so I think that, that has a real future, and that's something we're looking into a lot. The other side, the other one for me that's a big one is, uh, is in the health sector. Um, and I think what we're seeing is... is VR's ability to go a little actually pretty far beyond what we thought it was originally for. Um, it's showing an ability to kind of rekindle neuroplasticity and um, you know and some pretty interesting things that it, it allows as a form of kind of enhanced biofeedback. So we're seeing paraplegics that are get out, getting up and able to move their legs as a result of you know working in VR tools. Uh, we are, ourselves, we've been working with USC on a project for stroke rehabilitation, and it's very successful. Um, that is, it, it's showing, as I said, an ability to do things that even surgery and conventional physiotherapy can't do. And it's the tip of the iceberg, so a lot of promising stuff there. So before we uh, throw it out to you guys for some questions, I'm going to just uh, see if I can summarize a few things here. So from Roy, we learned about the three lives of VR. The three Waves. lives. Four. Yeah. Well, the fourth is the one that we're in now. Yeah. Uh, Joanna talked about the uh, five things that will make VR more accessible. Um, I think that was important. Uh, I love the idea of, of uh, guests creating their own experiences, and making memories together. I thought the idea of connection between the social between social media and VR as an experience is a pretty cool thing. Uh, the idea that creative should have a voice in the medium I think is a uh, um, uh, is coming from the creative side uh, uh, I'm pretty selfish about that. I think that you know, I was surprised to hear that um, because it you know to me it is a creative medium yeah. um, and uh, I think the lack of standardization is a really big issue. Uh, so all of these things, plus um, the idea of more interconnectivity among platforms, are, I think, some things to think about and things that people can walk away with and have a discussion about. I don't think we changed the world here today, but I do think <laughs> that we had some pretty interesting stuff and some pretty amazing guests on the panel. Uh, if any of you out there have any questions for them, please raise your hand. Now's the time. Yes, ma'am. I'd say in terms of the void, uh, I think people are conscious about what they're wearing, you know, because it is. You're, you're suiting up, you're, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's not a tethered experience. Um, you have a back top uh, uh, computer, so you're carrying the compute power on you. One of these days, you won't be, but uh, that's, that's, that's down the line. Um, and the headset, so at first they're really trying to adjust to it, but, but very quickly they're forgetting about that and they're, 
they don't realize it. they don't even think about that anymore because well, and, so and one of the experience. interesting things is that you can actually talk to other people that you're in there with so it's not just you in the void by yourself you're in there with other people you're communicating with them you're telling them to shoot this guy over there and to press that button over there and things are happening that you can control it's I, that's why i said it's just one of the most amazing things i've ever experienced and the other thing, another company that I worked for, Google Spotlight Stories, I don't know how many have, have seen that, but I just want to give a shout out to what Google's done and what the Spotlight Stories team has done because it's all about content, it's all about the creatives. Mm -hmm. They've produced now, they're coming out with a couple new pieces. You can download that app on your phone and it's the first time I, you know, the big thing was can you cry, will we make anybody cry in VR was, was one of the questions. We have an emotional experience and if, for those of you who haven't seen Pearl, um, I highly recommend that you do, and um, you'll you'll see what those guys are doing. So I just want to give them a little shout out. And of course, at the Void, we're completely focused on on the experience. We're focused on expansion, so everybody can see it, and we can get it out to all of our you know all the people that want to see it. But also, we're super focused on you know delivering the best quality content out there because if we don't deliver great content, again, it's just not going to be adopted. Nobody wants to see a bunch of bad stuff. You have you have to, to go do. out and check out the Void. You absolutely absolutely have to if you're sitting in this room and you're interested in VR we did not pay him we did not pay him. I'm just telling you thank you Frank yes ma'am okay easy question the void experience uh, when you go to the void it's about a 30 minute um, you go in and and there's sort of what we call our act one and, and, and pre-show and suit up and then go through the actual uh, virtual experience and then Take pictures with your friends if you want and uh, head out. So it's about a 30 minute overall experience and the cost is $30. 30 for 30. Yes. Hello. Hello. really interesting question. Um, I think the short answer is I don't honestly know. Um, I don't think the role of voices is going to go away. Um, it might increase a little bit. I mean, I'm thinking a lot about um, in augmented reality when we're going to have, you know, the superposition of, of objects and all kinds of things that we'd also kind of want to know what those are for. And, and I think that you might have more voices in the sense that you're having more voices with things like Siri and yeah, Alexa, I, that kind of thing. I, I so would I'm add probably that. go in the direction of more voices. I, also, I think also there's so many of the, the experiences right now are CG, so you need to match voices to those. So, like, yeah. for example, Baobab um, launched a project at, at Cannes, and they had voices from Oprah and John Legend and Diego Luna and many, many others. Mm. I, I think, think your, uh, your business uh, is safe for now. <laughs> no, Lincoln and the Bardo uh, made very good use of voices too. Yeah. There's a lady over there that's not Frank, I don't think. You know, I should also mention we can do interesting, more interesting things with voices in VR than we can in film and television because we can actually put a voice inside your head uh, right. and make that different to the, voice, to, to the sounds that are there. So we have these two different relationships. Yeah. And not, not to get too far off the track, but, but you touched on it, but the idea of the Amazon Alexa and the smart speakers and uh, AI attached to smart, to smart voice activation, that's, an, that's a new um, uh, and emerging platform uh, that I believe is going to be probably one of the more important things that, that hits our lives uh, at, since broadcasting. I think that may be one of the most important developments. The young lady over here had a question.
reaching younger audiences and creating the FOMO. Because of course, with that audience, it's all about the FOMO. Go ahead, Joe. I'm going to jump in. So I can, I mean, I would, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, I, well, yeah, well, for, absolutely for lenses. I think the numbers uh, was in part of a, a BCG and uh, Snapchat white paper that was released, and the number was something like 80 million the, the people first, the first are using one. the lens are using the filters and sna on, on Snap. So that is a huge number with huge reach, and obviously very much tar uh, very, very pre prevalent in the age group you're talking about. So. For, so for this, I, I'm answering this question not on behalf of HP because we are really focusing in, in this segment on B2B, um, but on behalf of all the companies that we partner with and in, on the, both on the LBE side and um, on the content side. I think it goes along with, there's a couple of things. So one, most of the companies don't have people with really strong marketing skill sets at the companies. They're also probably slightly underfunded, therefore they're not able to do as much as you they would want to. Um, but if you look at if you just well, watch the that, if you oh, watch sorry. the social followings of the companies, like they're very niche, they're very small, they're not using most of the best practices that people that are, are being used in film or TV, not just because of the fun, the lack of funding, but you know, just the fact that they're 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 start. It's a combination of startups funding and and probably not actually having that strong uh, deep understanding of, of how to best y y do the marketing. So, and frankly, also probably not even an aware awareness. It's, it's having lived in Silicon Valley and having lived it, it here. There's a big disconnect in sort of like what marketing is about. You know, is it product marketing? Is it growth marketing? Is it just PR? Um, and so I think that, you know, on the other hand, in, in Hollywood, the, the, they don't have those specifics, of, like, not the PR, obviously, but they don't have, like, a strong skill set around some of the performance marketing. So I think there's probably a, a good coming together in the marketplace from, you know, taking the best of both of both um, skill sets and bringing it to VR, but it certainly hasn't happened yet. Well, and, and, well, one, I, and this took one of Frank's questions earlier on that windowing strategy. Nobody, none of the company, you know, the companies get big bumps around film festivals, especially in press, and a little bit of bumps on social. But then they don't take you anywhere from there. They don't tell you, you know, coming, even, even in you know, a movie will, for one year, will tell you that that movie's coming soon. And, you know, do, do a whole, you know, uh, a constant drumbeat of, of, like, you know, content drops. So after that film festival, you have no idea where you can next find something or where it might go, or even that it's coming soon. Usually when you go to people's platforms, it doesn't even have a thumbnail of coming soon. So there's a big gap there that hopefully people like you can fill for some of these companies. Well, but also, <laughs> if, I mean, what I'm also hearing a lot of people here are talking about doing things that relate to bringing brands into these VR experiences. So the, if, if the brands are brands that, uh, that naturally target that demographic, yeah. that may be a way to uh, extend the yeah, brand. To fund it for sure. Exactly. Um, any other, uh, yes, sir? The, uh, the underfunding of content is, is clearly a uh, function of audience size. And I've seen great VR like for all that, that has a uh, screenwriter and producer and director uh, that, that creates emotional content. I always thought that gaming would be the killer app for VR to build the Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I've spoken about this publicly before. So the way that the, the large games publishers work, Electronic Arts, uh, Ubisoft, uh, these kind of companies, Bethesda, is that uh, when a console comes along, then the console manufacturer effectively primes the pumps by writing a very large check. So uh, you may recall, I mean, Gears, uh, Xbox really took off with Gears of War. Um, there wouldn't have been a Sega without Sonic the Hedgehog and so on. Um, so they were all waiting for the check, and it never came. So they didn't build the games. Um, they, the other way to do it is to do it naturally, where the, uh, the platform builds up until it's large enough to justify you investing yourself. But the platform volumes don't um, scale up without someone priming the pumps. And the sad fact is, nobody primed those pumps. 
The HTC didn't write a check. Oculus didn't write a check. So the big games didn't come. They still could. There's still time. Oculus, still time. <laughs> you could do it. Well, in fairness to Sony, they, they did. They did. Yeah. Yes, yes, Sony did. Yeah. And, and they did also invest in some yes, games. Yeah. And why didn't I don't know. For your next panel, I'd invite someone from well, Sony. I mean, they, I think, yeah, they're actually one of the better <laughs> selling. They're, they're, they're probably the best yeah. selling headset right now. So. Yeah, that's true. Well. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Sony, so Sony okay. have done the best job. And, yeah. uh, and hats Absolutely. off to them. They, uh, they deserve the success. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so um, we're, we are now over our allotted time. Uh, thank you uh, all for joining us here at Digital Hollywood for the uh, Immersive Media Think Tank, Roy Taylor, Joanna Popper, <laughs> Laura Feynman, Camille Colucci, Joel Dueck, and me, I'm Frank Radis. Bye-bye. <laughs> David, can we take a picture? Joanna, oh, yeah. pleasure to see you again. Do we, want to, Frank, do we need a picture? Yeah. Yeah.